Ah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. That's pathetic. Let's try that again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, that, that was far more convincing. Uh, welcome to Tank Fest. Uh, my name's Richard Smith. Uh, I'm the director of the Tank Museum, which essentially means I get paid for this. This is fantastic. Um, the, I'll, I'll try not to sound smug when I say that, because it, it's um, I have a job which leaves you with a lingering feeling of getting away with something. It's a very nice way to go to work. Um, Welcome to uh, something which I knew for Tankfest this year. We thought that uh, the audience uh, coming today would be interested in, in a, a bit of a wider look at some of the bits uh, of, of armoured warfare and the story of tanks uh, and the people who serve with them, which is, which is what we do here at the Tank Museum. So we've, this morning we've got a series of talks uh, for you from, from people who we have known for a very long time uh, and we think that you would be fascinated by what they have to say. Uh, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning. Um, now, our first speaker is someone whose name might not be familiar to you, but some of the things he's worked on probably are. So, has everyone here heard of Harry Potter films? Never. Uh, no, no, none of those, uh, absolutely. Um, James Bond movies, I've seen some of um, the Top Gear series. Um, there's a film called Star Wars, uh, which um, some people might have heard of. Um, the Dirty Dozen, Where Eagles Dare, Bridge Too Far, Vicar of Dibley. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, it's my delight to introduce today uh, one of the, uh, Britain's leading stuntmen, uh, who is a great friend of the Tank Museum, is here with the Wheel Foundation today, who bought our Yank Panther. Uh, could you join me in welcoming Jim Dowd? Good morning, boys and girls. Uh, I'm never very sure about this if everybody at the back can hear, because if you shout, I'm going to deafen you. So you guys OK at the back? You can all hear, can you? OK. We have to listen to you. Do we get free beer? Say again? If we have to listen to you, do we get free beer? Uh, no, you don't. Sadly not. But I'll work on that with Richard next time round. Uh, I'm going to let you guys ask some questions afterwards, but I am a bit deaf. Many years of gunfire and being in the military and blah, 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 and I didn't look up. So if I ask you to repeat it, please understand. Right. I've been very fortunate um, since the 60s, amongst other things, um, and I started, in, I started in circus when I was 16, um, and, and it's been downhill ever since, as far as my mother was concerned. Um, I started uh, working as an armourer in movies in the 60s, looking after the guns on various shows. And uh, things like The Dirty Dozen, which I'm sure there's some younger members here have never even heard of films like that, uh, Where Eagles Dare and Submarine X and Attack on the Iron Coast and all those kind of things that were popular in the 60s that didn't have tanks. Uh, and then, in, in fact, I've, I've written out a list, and so if anybody's interested, in, they want to ask questions on any of these other films, um, I did, these are the, some of the war movies, um, Dirty Dozen, Where Eagles Dare, Attack on the Iron Coast, The Bridge of Remagen, The Eagle Has Landed, The Bridge Too Far, Hanover Street, Force 10 from Navarone, and Saving Private Ryan, Golden Eye, which was a bomb, but that was because it was a tank, Richard III, Enemy at the Gates, Captain Corelli's Madeline, The English Patient, The Pianist, and Fury. Fury was the last film I said I would do because I'm, you know, quaking at the knees a, a, a little bit. But um, I first met a tank on the Dirty Dozen in the 60s, and we had some Stuart tanks which had been purchased with no turrets, and so the art department made up turrets out of wood, and they put a, 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 a sort of wooden barrel, or it may have even been a, a bit of scaffold pole at the front. I didn't know any different until I saw them driving down the road, and the whole thing was sort of wobbling like that, but that's actually what the, the movie business is all about. I went. I spent six months in Austria on Where Eagles Dare as an armourer, handing guns out to the various people and trying to keep them working in sub-zero temperatures and all that kind of stuff and um, learnt a huge amount about stunt people and thought, I think I can possibly make some more money not being an armourer, which was confirmed in a sequence when... Um, can I just have a show of hands to know who I'm talking to? Who's seen Where Eagles Dare? Oh, good. Okay. Right. Well, there's a scene in the corridor where Clint Eastwood is actually uh, Richard uh, 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 Richard Burton is doing you know broadsword Danny Boy and all that stuff, and uh, and then Clint Eastwood is holding off the bad guys. And at one point they said, 
we'd like to have an MG42, which is a big machine gun on a tripod comes in, but we're worried that the, the stunt guys won't know how to operate it if there's a, if there's a stoppage. Would you like to? Oh, really? So I got the uniform on and I went in and I rushed in and I fired the machine gun and then got killed by Clint Eastwood. And I got the, I got the equivalent of four weeks wages for a day's work. And I thought, hmm. So having done various other war films, including uh, uh, The Bridge at Remagen, which we went to uh, Czechoslovakia as it was then, and we were about 90% through the film when the Russians walked in and invaded uh, Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia as it was then, and we were locked in a hotel and all the guns were confiscated and there were tanks outside. And during the night, I'd heard tanks downstairs and we were on the sixth floor of the hotel and we were filming about an hour and a half outside Prague. And I heard these tanks in the car park and I was looking out the window in a pitch darkness because there was no street lighting in, in those sort of Iron Curtain countries in those days. But I could hear tanks maneuvering in the car park and I thought, some silly bugger's got it wrong. We finished with the tanks and not only that, they've sent it to the hotel, not the location. And I was laughing, at, you know, went back to bed and then all night I could hear these aeroplanes landing and all that kind of stuff. We went down in the lobby in the morning and there was indeed lots of blokes with AKs and tanks outside and um, uh, we did two or three days there and then we got flown to, to uh, Chinichita in Rome and we finished the film off there. And interestingly, this is just a sort of sideline, but all the guns obviously were confiscated. When we got back to UK, we claimed uh, to, on the insurance to get the, the, the price and we replaced all our World War II weapons with actually much nicer ones, but they cost a lot of money, but the insurers paid for it. And six months later, the whole lot turned up from uh, the Russians had boxed it all up and there wasn't a single round missing because they didn't want a diplomatic incident saying that they'd nicked all our weapons. So now we've got doubled up with the weapons and we have to give the money back to the insurers. But that's another story. So uh, this, uh, the, the early 70s come along, um, I joined a parachute regiment and I think, right, I'm going to be a roughy tufty soldier because my dad was at Arnhem. And uh, unfortunately, um, having got through that, I. Uh, I uh, did about 18 months and I did a night drop and uh, I got uh, very badly injured on my spine and that was the end of that part of my career so that was finished um, so I thought I'll go back into the stunt business so I did various things as uh, uh, just to make a living to get an equity card and I started in the stunt register in 1973 when, it, when the stunt register was formed and here we are, 19, uh, 20, whatever we are, and I'm quite old and a bit broken, but I've had a wonderful time. So, moving on to tanks. Um, a lot of those movies included tanks, and I wasn't really that interested. And then about 1976, 77, I got the opportunity to buy a Sherman Achilles, which I bought in a, in a mad rash moment. I was, I was earning quite good money doing some quite large films and I thought and I was a single man and I thought I've got motorbikes so I'll have a tank now which you do don't you you know why not I mean boys toys you don't get any bigger than boys toys unless you buy an aeroplane really but where I lived down in Sussex a dim view was taken when I used to drive the tank around the fields and then I had to work out taking it to a show was actually so prohibitive and uh, I thought, no, I've got to get rid of that. So I, I, I bought a duck instead, amphibious duck. And I had that for 25 years across the channel in it twice. That's another story. So I'm talking to you about tanks and I've got to actually refer to this list and just find out what I was going to talk to you about. Right, okay. Um, yeah, The Eagle has Landed. Now that was a film, that was the best film I think I've ever worked on. It was that hot summer of 76. Some of you will remember the hot summer of 76. No, there's a few heads nodding there. It was spectacular. We went off to Finland to film, and I was playing one of the uh, Michael Caine's paratroopers in that. And so we go off to Finland to play the, to, to do the Russian front scene. And <laughs> uh, we're there in this train, and the train has actually got some German equipment and vehicles on it, including two Stooks, which are German assault guns. And all I was interested in was looking at these things. They had Zundak motorbikes and all that. And every time that we were about to film, they'd say, uh, Jim, uh, when you're ready. And I'm like, oh yeah, look at this lovely tank. Oh, fantastic. Eventually, Michael Caine came out to me and he said, you're not well, are you? <laughs> he said, well, what is this obsession with bits of old kit? And I said, if I have to explain, you wouldn't understand. 
So there again began this interest in German armour. Previously, I'd only been interested in, in American stuff, and then um, I did a, a sort of some uh, some other odd war films, including one called Hanover Street, where I was doubling for uh, Harrison Ford. And I'd met Harrison on on the Star Wars a few years before, and we'd become quite good mates. And I was a reasonable double for him, and we were riding motorbikes. We were doing a motorbike chase there, and. We were actually filming in a place called Woodstock near Oxford, which was supposed to be the German headquarters. And so we had these two huge great swastika banners outside the uh, uh, what was the town hall in Woodstock. And we were doing a motorbike chase all round there with machine guns on the motorbikes and blah, 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 having a wonderful time. And it was summer. And we had told the locals that we would always finish at nine o'clock at night. And at quarter past, 20 past nine, we're still driving motorbikes around the town hall, firing machine guns. And eventually, a gentleman, and I do mean a gentleman, in a paisley dressing gown, with a double barrel shotgun broken <laughs> over his arm, comes out and he says, who's in charge here? And I pointed to the first assistant director, I said, who he is? So he came over and he said, uh, you said on the leaflet that you sent round to us, nine o'clock was the cutoff. My watch says 20 past nine. I'm taking a dim view. And he closed the shotgun. <laughs> and Scott Woodhouse was the first one. That's a wrap, boys. Thank you. <laughs> Carry on. Um, we had a lovely time on Bridge Too Far after I'd finished on Eagles Landed. I went out to Holland and uh, I wanted to see the jumps because my dad had been there. And when I was actually in the regiment, I was allowed to wear his parachute regiment badge, which had the king's crown on it. I was always being pulled up for being improperly dressed. And then I'd say, well, this was my dad's, and it, uh, he was at Arnhem. And they'd go, all right, you're allowed to wear it. And I was the only bloke in the battalion allowed to wear the king's crown on my, on my cap. Um, I wanted to go out there and see um, the, the jumps, because to see 12 Dakotas chucking a whole bunch of guys out over the site that it actually happened was a, incredible privilege so I didn't go out there to work on the film I rode my brand new Harley Davidson electric light which is like a cathedral organ on wheels and I, I took that out to, to Holland with a sleeping bag and um, sort of it, it installed myself in a mate of mine's caravan to watch the jumps and I got asked to then work on the show by a guy called Roy Button who's now the head of Warner Brothers Europe even then those days he was the second assistant director and he said, will you teach the Dutch extras how to use these weapons? Because they keep on putting stones down them and then trying to fire them with a blank and all that sort of stuff. It's not the way we want them to be firing up at these poor guys coming down in parachutes. So um, I said, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but you're going to have to pay me the right money because I'm now a stuntman and we're not allowed to do extra work. So I, I was effectively the highest paid armourer on the set. And then we did the river crossing with Cook's, Cook's Crossing with Robert Redford. And... Uh, Robert Redford was being paid a million dollars for 10 days work. That's $100,000 a day, this is in 1976, that's a whole bunch of cash. And he wouldn't get his hair cut, because it was the 70s and he was a very pretty boy, so the, 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 the makeup people had to push his hair up underneath his helmet. And you'll notice it, in one, if you look carefully in one or two shots, you'll see this sort of blonde thing flopping out from behind, and he wouldn't cut his sideboards off to the correct length, and he wouldn't wear the, the, the normal paratrooper boots because he said he couldn't look nimble enough so they had to get baseball boots and paint them brown and he carried a wooden rifle because the other one was too heavy hundred thousand dollars a day think about it so we're doing the crossing which is where we're in a whole load of boats crossing over the Vile Canal which is a busy waterway and they've closed the waterway for an hour on a Sunday morning for us to do this now we've been down on the riverbank from two o'clock in the morning all dressed up and ready to go and Robert Redford is late so that we're now getting the needle because we've had no you know tea and a wad or anything no, nothing has, has reached us and we're cold and it's September and we're getting chilly so we all get into these ba these boats and I'm in the boat ahead of Redford now on the other bank they're on a thousand millimeter lens so they can see up his nose they can see his nose hair I mean it's the real close-up stuff so he can't misbehave so in our boat there's a there's a special effects guy with a charge on a sort of on a waterproof boat, and he's letting the charge out so that when it gets near Redford's boat, bang, and it, it looks like a shell burst landing alongside it. 
and I'm in the front, we've all got the needle, and, the, and I knew the guy, the special effects guy, and I said, John, just let it out a bit, let, let it out a bit. He said, he's getting closer. I said, get it closer, get it closer. And eventually, it, we got within about three feet of the boat. I said, now, go back. And the equivalent of a bathtub of water landed on Robert Rayford's head. And it, now he's absolutely drenched. He's coming up, paddle. Hail Mary, mother of God. And he's dripping down. And we're all sitting there laughing our nuts off. It was, it was classic. And the, the current on the valve was so tough that they hadn't taken account of that, even though we had these little hidden outboard motors in. And we actually landed 300 yards further down from where the special effects had rigged all the bangs and everything else. But they'd been told, when we hit the bank, fire all the explosions. You know, uh, brain dead. Uh, and they actually, as we hit the bank 300 yards down, they set all the explosions up 300 yards up there, because that's what they'd been told. To. So they had to go back and do the whole thing again. They had to get permission to change the shut the vial off and blah, 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 blah. So that was pretty stupid. It was a, a fascinating, fascinating experience, though, to be there and see those jumps and do all that kind of stuff. Um, I was supposed to talk about tanks, hadn't I? Um, I did Goldeneye. Goldeneye was, uh, I mean, really an extraordinary experience, not only because the bonds themselves we got together every 18 months, nearly two years, to do a Bond film. It was like a family. We, uh, you know, we used to teach Barbara Broccoli when she was a kid who was the producer of the Bonds. We used to bounce her up and down on the trampoline and teach her various bits and pieces when she was a kid, and she's now the, the big cheese, as you know. Um, but when Goldeneye happened, when Roger Moore had gone, Pierce Brosnan now comes in as, and it's his first trip as Bond. Now, I knew Pierce from the early 70s. I used to teach him unarmed combat when he was at drama school. Uh, and I used to take him out for beans on toast, you know, because he didn't have a pot to piss in in those days. So now he's come back and he's the man. And so we did a sequence at the right at the beginning of the film when my buddy Wayne Michaels dives off the dam, which is a fantastic stunt. I mean, that was done for real. No computers, no, that was the real, the real deal. And then you see Bond coming through the roof and there's a Russian in the Kazi with his trousers around his ankle reading a paper. And Pierce went, I know who's going to be that man. <laughs> so that was my seminal appearance sitting on the Kazi. And I had to do another one years later for Top Gear, when I don't know how many of you watched Top Gear, but we did one where um, we had uh, 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 like caravans mounted on rail wheels being pulled by a car. And we had first class second class and scum class at the back and the scum class one had an outside toilet okay literally outside the back and and jeremy said right you're going to be sitting on the car seat with your trousers around your ankles i've seen you do it before so that's kind of my typecasting so now we're going to do this tank chase in goldeneye and uh originally we were going to shoot it in russia at a tank depot and they went there on a recce and it, this tank division had just come back from exercises in Mongolia and we couldn't understand what the problem was and then there was a new commander of the tank regiment and the reason he was a new commander was that while they were out there on exercise they'd lost, lost three T-55 tanks because the guys had nicked them and sold them on the black market. <laughs> this is absolutely true. So we decided this was not going to happen, so we're going to make them in England. So we buy three T-55 tanks, which need to look like T-72s. The problem is, uh, we're going to go and film in St. Petersburg, and they've said you cannot run steel tracks on the road in St. Petersburg. So I thought, how are we going to do this? And then I thought, I looked at a, a, a chieftain tank track pad, which has got, uh, you know, a, a rubber grouses on it, and I thought, if we're a bit clever, we might be able to do this with Chieftain Track. So we bought a whole load of Chieftain Track. We got the special effects guys to make up special sprockets at the back. I cut all the horns off the inside because they were too wide. They would have been rubbing on the inside of the tank. Spent a whole day doing that on both sides. And it worked. So now we've got rubber track pads. But now we've got to make the, the tank slide. And the track pads are brand new. They're too grippy. So I've got to spend all day driving this thing up and down airfield sliding it about to wear the rubber down so that we can start to slide it and then we start putting diesel and water we start putting uh, fairy liquid and water until we get the right uh, a, a mixture to get the tank to slide properly because the t55 has got a two-speed rear axle 
So when you pull back on the left-hand tiller, what you're doing is actually reducing the gear on the left-hand side rather than just a normal trap brake, which gives you a very sharp way of turning in that tank. So the combination of that, the rubber just skimming the road so that it wasn't leaving too much of a mark, and the diesel and, well, the, the magic formula, which I can't tell you because I'm sworn to secrecy. And we eventually got, to, got the tank to broadside here and there, and it worked out quite nicely. And then we would put Pierce in the driver's seat, so we had to cut another hatch for him to do his mean, moody, and magnificent bit, whilst we were actually driving the tank using a series of, of uh, videos, uh, cameras. I had one underneath the barrel, two on a pod either side, and three little screens inside. The problem was I couldn't get a clear image of how far people were away because it was a wide angle lens. Somebody who was 10 feet away actually looked like they were 30 feet away, which for safety point of view is not the way to go. So eventually I cut out a piece of armour out of the front of the glasses and that armour is that thick. It took me all day again, more and more and more uh, settling. And uh, then I could actually have a little window which we covered over with a lamp and bits of scrim and everything. And at least I could have a three-dimensional image to get uh, to get the, you know to find out actually where people were. And so we trotted off to St Petersburg and we did, we rolled over vehicles and we ran about there and everything else. And then we came back to uh, to the studio and we were going to shoot the whole thing out there. This is absolutely true. When we got out there, and they were charging something like a one and a half million dollar facility fee for using the streets in St. Petersburg. On one of the Sundays that we were filming out there, they said to us, sorry, no more filming. We need another million dollars, another million dollars to continue. So we're all standing around at seven o'clock in the morning, scratching our asses, waiting to see what's going to happen. And the producer goes to the mayor of St. Petersburg, knocks on his door, before eight o'clock in the morning, the guy comes out in a dressing gown and he's got a translator with him and he says, you have no idea the public publicity power of a Bond film. If you continue down this road of preventing us from filming, having paid you one and a half million dollars facility fee, you will be on the front page of every major newspaper around the world tomorrow. Here is $10,000 in cash. Go back in your house, make the phone call and we expect to be filming in half an hour. And we were. And that was 1996. I, I don't know whether it's any better or any worse there now. Anyway, we did the film. We had a lot of fun on it. Um, I kept on occasionally when Pierce was driving, I'd reach across and, and squeeze his knee and react to that, you know, because I thought I'm going to get you back for making me sit on the bog. And it was, it was great. And I thought actually it was, it was a really innovative sequence because you always try and get something different in the bond and uh, the tank chase was certainly different and I've never seen anything like that since. Uh, and then we also did the chase on the ice on uh, Die Another Day where we took three Aston Martins and three Jaguars out to Iceland to do this chase on the ice. And, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to talk about tanks, aren't I? Can you ride with this just for a minute because it's quite interesting. Um, and so, I go out there a week early. Now these cars have been converted, they've had the original engines taken out and we put V8, uh, big normally aspirated engines in and a driven front axle from a Ford Explorer and a Land Rover transfer case. They've spent 1.2 million pounds converting these six vehicles to make them four wheel drive, essentially. And now I'm going out there a week early to find out which length of ice spike is gonna work. The, the ice spike that we had that was probably about two and a half inches, those of you who speak metric can convert it in your own time, I don't know. Uh, they made the car stick like shit to a blanket. No kids here. Uh, the short ones, you didn't get any adhesion. The intermediates were perfect unless you really wanted to brake hard, in which case they wouldn't have said. Everything needed to be done by power in the car, and so you power slid and you, and you used the gearbox to brake. And it was a fascinating experience. But when we were tra training out there, they had blocked off an isthmus so that the, the ice would get deeper and deeper and deeper. And we needed 42 centimeters of ice before they would let the film unit on. But they didn't. With the same rules didn't apply to us. We were in uh, survival suits, and the cars had uh, in, a sort of inflation device that if they did go through the ice, this thing would inflate on contact with water. But the car would be like that. So Muggins would have had to wait it and then got out of the car once it was filled with water 
and then try to get up through the hole in the ice. I, I had this feeling they didn't really care that much about us. They're much more worried about the car. And I've got film at home of us testing this thing. And as we're driving down, you can see the ice actually moving behind the vehicle. It was really quite um, afterwards where we looked at it, we thought, it must be mad. Anyway, the, we did the film out there. We filmed for nearly two weeks. Every day the sun shone, every night it froze incredibly hard. And a local said, I've, I've lived, he was 70. He said, I've lived here all my life. He said, I've never seen weather like this. You know, God obviously loves James Bond. Because the day we finished, the ice started to melt. And we were going to fi film the whole day. And by midday, the, the safety people said, sorry, it's, it's melting at too much of a rate. You've got to go. But we got everything we needed. It was just pure luck that that happened. So um, I did a couple of other you know, war movies and, and things. And I did Richard III, which has a big sequence. And we used the T-55s that we'd used on Goldeneye. So again, I was driving that tank through a wall and various things. and and having fun with tanks, but not, you know, you're not allowed to say that. And then uh, we did Private Ryan. Now, Private Ryan really was a, it was an experience because those of us who are interested, I mean, really sadly interested in World War II, and I mean, you know, battlefield visiting and models and, and I've got a Jeep and a duck and a tank and motorbikes, and oh dear, it's really sad. Um, for us, war movies have always got massive holes in them in terms of, of, of accuracy. And when we got together to do Private Ryan, we had people in the costume department who were collectors. We had, um, we had webbing wranglers. We had people who knew exactly how it should have been for that month of the war. And believe me, costumes and things changed very much so in World War II, and the campaigns and whether you're in the desert and everything else. And previously, costume people just said, oh, you put a German uniform, you put some, some uh, rifle pouches on it, you give them a gun and away they go. Not on that film. And they went to huge amount of trouble, like, like the combat vests that they had that we had made in Italy. And then we would literally wrap a rope around them and drag them around the field behind a jeep for 10 minutes to, 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 to you know, wear them down and all that kind of stuff. And those combat vests, the, 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 the airborne ones, have a little pocket up here by, uh, 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 in case you get stuck up in a tree and you can't actually reach your knife down here on your boot, you can actually access this little pocket in your, in your, uh, just under the collar and get this knife out so that you can cut yourself free. Now, who's going to know about that? But they put the pocket in and they, they managed to find a few of those knives and they put them in the lead actor's ones just so that they could feel the part. That was real attention to detail. That really was absolutely fantastic. So we get to the scene in Lamel, which is the battle at the end. And um, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be driving the half-track when Private Ryan, we first meet him, and he bazookas the half-track. Now, when a special effects man says to you, there might be a bit of a bang, because <laughs> they always say to you, no, 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 it's a little squib, and your head's ringing up. He said, well, there might be a bit of a bang. You think, okay, you'll take this one seriously. So now, I put wax in my ears, covers over there, I've wrapped a, a towel around myself and, I, and then I found the biggest helmet and I wedged the helmet on and I'm thinking here it comes here. I cannot explain to you when that explosion went off, I, I just my ears were absolutely ringing. It was like being in a dustbin and having six people hitting it with a baseball bat on the outside. Just, it really was a serious bang. So that was, you know, that was that. And then we go into the village of Ramel and the next sequence is um, uh, let me think which way around we did it. Yes, okay, so we had a Marder, which is a German uh, uh, self-propelled gun. And the shot is, uh, who hasn't seen Private Ryan? Look at that's great, I've never, oh, one person. Yeah, you're not, you're not on my next movie. It's people like you that keep people like me out of work. Please go and see it. Um, there's a, so, you see these guys light these, these uh, uh, um, Molotov cocktails and they chuck the Molotov cocktail down into the fighting compartment. Now, I'm driving the tank, and I'm going, if one of those buggers misses the driving compartment, it's going to land on my hatches, and I can see daylight through the hatch. It's an old vehicle. So I put on my fire suit, because every good stuntman has a fire suit. And it was weather like this. It was absolutely steaming in there. But I brought a little fire extinguisher in the, in the uh, dri uh, uh, driving compartment with me. And Simon, who was the stunt coordinator, had said, whatever you do, 
keep going. Don't, as, as the band goes off, don't just stop. Because these things, you know, drivers are not aware and might have been hit. I don't want it stopping. I want it to drive another eight or nine yards before it grinds to a halt. So, so the Molotov cocktails come down. And of course, one hits on the edge and all the burning fuel is now pouring through this onto the family allowance. And it's getting hot. And I'm listening to the walkie with one hand. And with the other hand, I've got the thing and I'm actually spraying CO2 onto this area which ladies don't know about and trying to maintain enough to get another seven or eight yards without my eyes watering and blinding me to this thing and I thought no they're gonna have to pay me quite a lot of money for this one and I stepped out and of course all this was absolutely white because CO2 freezes everything and I'm walking like this afterwards oh god and Simon came up to me and said, it's all right, so I've got plenty of 50 pound notes for you for that one. So, so that was nice. And then finally, I'm driving the Tiger, which was in fact a, uh, a Russian T-34 converted to look like a Tiger. And it was interesting because the Tiger has got such a reputation that everybody who doesn't know about it thinks, ah, so when Spielberg saw it, he was rather disappointed. He said, I thought the Tiger was the size of a house. And so, and, and the dimensions were right, but obviously the wheel stations and things were wrong on that. And, and anybody, any of you guys that know anything about tanks, and you look at a T-34 and you look at a Tiger, the wheel stations are completely different, but I'm not gonna go into all that, because the girl bore the girls to death. So this is the sequence where they, they, uh, they put a, a, a sticky bomb on it and it blows the track off. So I'm now driving the tank, and then what happens is the tank, the, the, the track rolls off and then Tom Hanks comes up and he sticks his Tommy gun through the hatch, uh, through the vision slit. And I thought now, a, a 45 caliber Thompson submachine gun coming through about three inches from my ear, I'm gonna be in trouble again. And bless him, Tom came up and said, are you gonna be okay in there? And I said, don't worry sir, as you come towards me, I'm gonna flatten myself on the floor. Bearing in mind that this tank was so knackered, it was a wash. In, in, in oil on the floor and you had to change gear with a five pound club hammer because it was so knackered. But I didn't have to change gear for that sequence. But bless him, he stuck, he, he, he stuck the tommy gun through and I was on the floor, but my God, I was deaf afterwards. But again, you can always rub the embrocation on with a 50 pound note afterwards. So we did that. I'm, I'm, I'm just allowing a little bit of time. I was gonna tell you about Fury, but we've only got 10 minutes left. Is that right, Richard? You sure? Top man, Richard. Top man. I'll pay him later. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that was Private Ryan, and that was fantastic. So then there was a series of other films I did, uh, uh, Force 10 from Navarro, which was wonderful, with Edward Fox, and Edward Fox was our, our, our guest here about four years ago, and him and I had a lovely day reminiscing about being out in Yugoslav <laughs> Yugoslavia in the winter. And a little story about that was that we arrived uh, to this tiny little hotel in a place called Jabiak, which is in Montenegro, and there's nothing there, it's a dirt street. And they put the stunt crew in this tiny little hotel, and we went in there, and everybody else was about an hour and a half drive away. They thought, oh well, you know, they won't mind, the stunt boys are all roughy tufty they're all 10 feet tall, bulletproof and invisible, they won't moan about it. So we go into this place, there's, no, there's virtually no heating, and I go up to my room, and it's, it's a cell. It's not a room, it's a cell. Okay, it's about eight, nine foot by about five, six feet. There's an army cot in the corner with a table with three legs because the left one's bust and it's wedged into the corner to stop it falling over. And a, and, a, and a window like that where you've got to stand on the chair which you have to put your suitcase on in order to open the window if you wanted to. But it says it's about minus four or five at night. Don't go there. So we all come down to the lobby and we're, everybody's slightly shocked at where we're gonna have to spend five weeks in this place. And the stills man was a lovely old guy called Laurie Ridley, who was in his 50s there, and that to us is a really old man. But he was small and dumpy, and he had a proper room. But he comes down and he says to this guy, you the manager, I mean the manager doesn't speak a word of English, so he's literally got him like this and said, right, upstairs. So we troop up after him, goes into the room, now there's about eight or nine of us now, saying, what, hang on, what's going on here? Laurie pulls the, 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 the mattress back, and there's a dead rat that's stuck to the mattress springs. And it's obviously been feeding on the mattress when somebody sat on the bed and squashed it, right? 
God knows how long that thing's been there, but it's dried. So Laurie stands back and goes, with an inquiring question mark above his head. The guy looks at this, he peels the dead rat off the springs, he goes over to the, Laurie had a French window on the balcony, puts the mattress back and goes, I swear to you, absolutely. If you had a bath, there was a, a, a plastic washing up bowl in the other corner of the bath. There was only enough hot water for one bath a night, so you had to have departmental bath nights, and we draw lots about who was going to go in first and who was going to go in last. And you, when you wanted to empty the bath, you had to drag this bowl across, empty the, you know, empty the, put, pull the plug out, fill it up, and then drag it across the other side of the room and, and tip it down the thing. This was filmmaking. This was luxury filmmaking. So Robert Shaw and all the other ones were all miles away having a lovely time and we did five weeks under, under those sort of circumstances. Very interesting. Um, Fury. I'll talk about Fury a little bit because it was a fascinating experience because again the director David Ayer is a collector. He collects uh, a lot of uniforms and things and his uh, assistant uh, who was also in charge of, uh, of the costume department is also a mad uh, collector. In fact, his, he, his website is Camo Man or his email is Camo Man. I mean, they're all serious collectors, so they wanted to do it right. So when we, were, when we got hold of the tanks and we were dressing the tanks, and bear in mind the Sherman had two or three, well, at least three, I think four different engine configurations, and we had the lot on that film, including Fury, which comes here from the museum. And um, so the, the work in keeping those vehicles running was really, really tricky, particularly the ones that have got the radial engine. Now, for those of you, anybody who doesn't understand about how a radial engine, those radial engines are normally fitted in aircraft, which are designed to run at top speed for hours and hours at a time. If you keep switching them on and switching them off, as we were in a film set, the, the cylinders at the bottom tend to fill up with oil. And then if they don't clear, you have to actually change the spark plugs and to actually access the spark plugs, you have to lower somebody in by their feet upside down so they can access the 18 mil spark plugs. So you're a bit like a one-armed paper hanger when you're trying to put all this together. And um, so we'd train them. I worked with the boys quite a lot with Brad Pitt and those, those uh, strange actors uh, in terms of being able to access and get inside and outside the tank rapidly. And I spent literally probably a morning with them doing that and it actually reminded me of teaching Jude Law and Ed Harris how to shoot rifles on, on uh, Enemy at the Gates which I'm just going to pass back to Enemy at the Gates because we did have tanks on Enemy at the Gates so right and I, I wanted to again because Stalingrad is a, fa is a, is a fascinating fascinating um, sorry my phone key, I should have switched that off but um, I don't know how to switch it off now. Go away! Um, uh, because I, 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 Stalingrad is a fascinating campaign, and it's a true story. It's a story about a, 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 a two snipers in the ruins of, of, of Stalingrad hunting one another. And uh, the director, Jean-Jacques Arnaud, who became known as Jean-Jacques I Know, because he said he knew about everything, and he knew absolutely bugger all, actually. Um, said, I want them to shoot properly. I went, of course you do, absolutely. So I took, I took Jude down to, and I'd done a film with Jude called Shopping years before, so you know, I, I knew him quite well. I took him down to, to, uh, to, to Bisley to teach him how to shoot the Nagant rifle. And I got a mate of mine who's sniper trained, and I got him to come in his ghillie suit, and I got him to hide. And I said to Jude, right, where's the sniper? And he said, He's not here. I said, it is. Oh, well that's him over there, that bush. You know? Closer. And eventually, and I promise you, my man was sitting probably 25 feet away. And I said, up you go. And he stood up and, uh, and Jude went, okay, I take your point. I said, yeah, it's about camouflage and concealment. You don't stand in the middle and start shooting a rifle. You hide yourself and you look after that scope sight of yours. And I made him walk around with it, cradled across his arm so that the sight could, and if anybody came near him, I said, you go sideways and you put your hand out or do whatever it wants, but you don't let anybody near that sight. And then I gave him a dummy one 
to take back to the to the uh, to the hotel at night to practice crawling with it. <laughs> and we got a call from the hotel saying one of the chambermaids was slightly upset because she'd come into this room and it was very dim lighting and there was a man crawling across the floor with a rifle in his pyjamas. <laughs> so when we got to Germany, I said, right, I need to do this with Ed Harris, who plays the German uh, sniper. So I took him on the range outside Berlin. And again, it's cold. It's really, really cold. It's like minus three, minus four. We're out near Potsdam. And I gave him 80 rounds of live ammunition, you know, because that rifle kicks. And I said, whatever you do, don't get near the sight. 70, on the 79th round, he was tired, it was cold, but I was determined to do the 80 rounds with him so that he could actually appreciate what the loading cycle was and to absolutely instinctively fire the round and then get another round in the breach because an empty, uh, empty rifle is no good to you. So he was doing really well, but on the 79th round, he got close to it. It came back and bit him, and he had to have three stitches in there. And if you look closely at the beginning of the film, you'll notice, however much the makeup is there, you can still see that little cut there. I had 200 Russian extras that I had to kind of somehow get used to the Mosin Nagant rifle, which is a powerful piece of kit, uh, even though only one in five had a rifle, because at that time they didn't have enough rifles to go around. They would give one in five and one in three guys a rifle, and, and when the guy got killed, the next guy would pick the rifle up and continue the charge. And we tried to reproduce that as much as we could, but I said, you need to be aware of the power of the blank round. So the first morning, and bear in mind that this is the Russian, these are Russian extras who live in Berlin. There's a big Russian population there. And in the morning, um, they would arrive, and they'd been, a lot of them had been on the vodka. A lot of them that came to the, to the casting session on a Saturday were so pissed they didn't realise they'd got the job. People were ringing them on Monday and say, you'll be in tomorrow for a fitting. And they go, what are you talking about? I mean, they were seriously... So I've got 200 of these guys in various states. So what I used to do was to get a melon and put it on the top of a, of a post and put the muzzle of the Nagant up to it and literally it would vaporise the melon. And that's something that actually does get people's attention. So every morning I do it and they go, okay, no, no, okay. Because to have 200 guys running across with explosions going off, with rifles firing blanks, was I was seriously, seriously worried about that and touched with we, we got away with it, but it was just getting away with it. But we did have tanks. We did have tanks on that. Now, look, I'm going to let you guys, if you guys have got questions, apart from the free beer, uh, has anybody got questions? Sir? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you'll have to speak up because I'm a bit deaf. You were watching Bridge Too Far. Yes. Driving his own Jeep, yeah. Yeah, the gentleman's just saying on Bridge Too Far, we saw General Horrocks driving his own Jeep about, and in fact, he would have had a driver. Uh, that is that beautiful thing called cinematic license, which uh, you know, belies any historical accuracy in most war films, which we, I hope we didn't do in Private Ryan. Um, but sadly, there were a huge number of mistakes. And I, you know, when I look at some of the films that I've done, which I've lent, I did a thing called The English Patient, and we had. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a funny story about The English Patient. It's quite interesting. There's a, a, has anybody not seen The English Patient? Same hands at the back there. Look, you're really terrible. Anyway. Okay, so there's a scene in the desert where they're driving these Model A Fords across, uh, across the desert and, and uh, 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 Ray Fiennes is looking at this kid who's on the roof because I think he's a bit sort of limp-wristed in it. And um, uh, uh, this kid looks over... And the, anyway, the net net is that the, the Model A Ford rolls down the, the sand dune. So I was working out how on earth are we going to get a Model A Ford to actually roll in sand, because it, it, its natural inclination is to go over like that, plonk, it's going to stick. And the director was adamant it had to roll down to the bottom of the dune. So we were filming in Chile Cheetah Studios in Rome, and they were doing a film called Daylight next door with Sylvester Stallone, you know. Uh, and some mates of mine, uh, stunt engineers, were working on it. And I went round to them and I said, 
how am I going to get this Model A Ford to turn around? And, and uh, this pair, I've known them for like 30 years. They always work together. Very, very clever guys. And they looked at me and they both chorused and they said, Peanut. I went, yeah, fine. But how am I going to get the company? They said, Peanut. Now, those of a certain generation who will remember that you used to be able to buy a little plastic cylinder with a ball bearing in it. And if you put it on a table and tipped it like that, it would go ka-clonk, 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 all the way down. And it was known as a, as a mechanical peanut to some of us. So I said, you serious? And he said, yeah. So they built me a cage in the back of the Model A Ford. And then they put an equivalent, if you imagine a slice of a Swiss roll, which was made of lead, which weighed just over a quarter of a ton inside that cage with a release mechanism. So that when the Model A went over on the dune, it rolled across to the other side and the impact of it hitting flipped over. So all the way down the dune it's going clonk, clonk, and the sound man's going, oh, that's dreadful. I'm going, did you get the thing to roll down the thing? Yeah, what are you worried about the sound for, for Christ's sake? Anyway, it worked beautifully and I went back to those guys and I took them out for a very expensive dinner after when we came back from Tunisia. And it was, a, it, I was so pleased, just one of those things Pure luck. If the guys hadn't been there, I'd have been scuppered. I don't know what we'd have done. Uh, one, one more question, Jim. Yes. Oh, one more question. Yes, sir. How many times have you shot yourself on film? How many times have I? Shot yourself on film. Got myself on film? Shot yourself. I can't. I'm sorry. Shot, shot yourself. Shot myself. Oh, my God. Shot myself. Well, shot myself. I shot myself once on the Eagle has landed, where I was playing one of Michael Caine's paratroopers, and we're in the water mill, and there are Americans running around and things, and I come out of the water mill, and I fire my stand gun at this jeep that goes past, and then they said, well, you're gonna be driving the jeep when we drive it into the pond. So I switched uniforms and got into the jeep and drove the jeep into the pond, so technically, I shot myself. <laughs> I, think, I think I've had my time. Thank you very much for listening to my blather. I'm sorry it wasn't more about tanks, but Richard just said keep going. Thank you, Jordan. I could listen to Jim all day. Please join me one more time in uh, thanking our speaker this morning, Mr. Jim Zaldin.